Hi everyone and thank you for joining us here at COP27. I hope you all made it okay into this climate innovation zone. Uh, we know that we are not going to have any climate innovation if it's not for not just actors at the state level but also for non-state actors and this panel really is about thinking in different ways about what is it going to take for us to have global emissions by 2030 and unite behind the science if we're going to keep the 1.5 degree pathway barely within reach and I'm very privileged to have this panel with us. Um, my name's Raj and I'm Scottish. Um, I, I was in Glasgow for COP26. Um, happy to be in the warm weather here at COP27 and um, here with of course um, Laurence Tubiana as a, as a chief architect of the Paris Climate Agreement. We're very honoured to be here in, in Laurence's presence. Um, also with our minister, um, Matt Keane, from the government of New South Wales in uh, Australia. And uh, Andrew Kamau, who's the principal secretary of petroleum and mining for the government of Kenya uh, here on the continent. And the discussion we're having today is really to look at the role of non-state actors as we think about the future of climate cooperation, how do we start to recognize that climate action is actually something that everyone has a responsibility to drive? And in fact, as we walk away from the discussions we'll have here in Sharm El Sheikh, let's hope perhaps that we can start to inspire action on the part of many, not just a few. Um, so I'd like to start perhaps with you, Laurence. Um, as you envisage the Paris Agreement, there were many uh, discussions and a lot of work that went into getting countries to get an agreement um, but a core part of that agreement was recognizing that it would require the energy and the, the, the political will and the passion of so many more than those that were in the room. Um, how are you thinking about what's lying ahead and the role of subnationals and non-state actors if we are to go to the finish line and really take this agenda forward? Yep, the when preparing for the framework of the Paris Agreement, I, it was very evident that climate action depends of many, many actors. Uh, and so that governments alone could not deliver the very ambitious transformation, which is a technical, economical, and social transformation that is needed. And so many different actors, whether it is on finance, on business, and in a way very close to citizen, because the first element is this change cannot happen if the citizen are not behind it. So the first thing was to try in the agreement to recognize that governments were not alone. That was Paris, here, one of the pillars of Paris Agreement, and from there started a number of initiatives we know now, and that has been formalized into, uh, one, on one side, the champions, which were created by the Paris Agreement on one side, and the in integration progressively of the subnational. But I think we are the different, and, and finally, uh, it was a, a, good, a good bet, because as soon as uh, the Trump administration, Trump decided to withdraw from Paris Agreement, we saw immediately a number of states and cities uh, of US, which who will be there again, and saying, Maybe the Washington government is going out, but we are still in. And that was exactly what I thought that, you know, we, we were, of course, anticipating maybe height and lows. In 2015, governments have signed up for a very ambitious target for 1.5 degree for net zero emission uh, by, by 2050 or earlier. And so sometimes they didn't realize what they were signing off. That's for sure. And I remember that. But now, of course, uh, the, the idea is that now everyone is taking these, these objectives and trying to translate into their own policies, and that's why the subnational level is so crucial, because a number of levers are in the hand of the subnational, in, in some political system at least. So that's the one, the levers are there, and the ambition is there. Just looking at uh, our colleague from uh, Australia, it was so in a way inspiring to see that even the government of Australia, of course the previous one, didn't want any commitment and would have been happy probably to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, but could not do that because all the provinces were 
wanting to go faster and take, in a way, not derail the direction of travel. So that's what I call the subnational, the safety net of the Paris Agreement. They are the ones who hold the line. And finally, I think this level of government uh, are held account by, accountable by their citizens, by their votes, and then they can influence as well the accountability of national government. So my plan here during the next two weeks is to really try to push for a transformation of the governance of the UNFCCC and have a much more formal recognition into the preparation of the next uh, level, the next cycle of the national determined contribution to recognize the role and the specific contribution on uh, the subnational. And I would be happy to see what is your opinion about that. So, um, Matt, what do you think the, the role is of non-state actors? Do you see them as more action-oriented? And what is the opportunity building on what Laurence has said? Well, yeah, and I have to agree very strongly with Laurence. I think that sub-national governments have a really important role to play. Firstly, in dragging recalcitrant national governments to where they need to be, as we saw in the United States under the Trump administration, a lot of the subnational governments, California, Washington, a whole raft of state actors were the ones that continued to reduce emissions, uh, continued to drive the agenda forward while in the face of a national government that didn't want to take any action. We saw a similar thing in Australia. My state is the largest state in the Commonwealth. It's about a third of the size of the Australian economy. And whilst the national government had very poor ambitions, around 27% emissions reduction on 2005 levels. Uh, my state has a fifth, uh, uh, this by 2030, my state has a 50% emissions reduction target by 2030 and uh, will exceed that based on the implementation plans. The second thing that I'd say is that a lot of the subnational governments and a lot of the political systems are responsible for the delivery of the targets set by national governments. So they have the levers to be able to actually drive the outcomes. So in my state, we run the electricity grid. We are in charge of the planning system. We run the transport system. Those big sections of the economy, which produce a lot of emissions, are in the hands of subnational governments. So they're really well placed to be able to not only drive the agenda, but deliver on the agenda, which is why I want to back in Lawrence's point and say that subnational governments have a really important role to play if we're going to achieve our collective ambitions. Thank you. Andrew, you're on the front lines of many of these questions. Uh, in Kenya, we're you know, in a continent where 600 million people still don't have access to energy. And at the same time, balancing that with the need to be here at COP27 in a way that is also demonstrating leadership on this agenda. Um, and at the same time, as a principal secretary of energy, working on this question around working with multiple types of stakeholders from regulators, to business, to civil society, um, to, to farming communities. How is it that you see this, this opportunity in terms of the role of non-state actors in working together as we think about the governance of our climate agenda and what it is that will enable us to really move this agenda forward from your perspective as someone working on this question in Kenya? Uh, thanks, Raj. I think one of the things that we, we have to look at is uh, the role of African governments. It's not like you know, the US government or European governments where there is money to be spent on quite a few of these issues. Um, generally, African governments have to do with social, they have to take care of social goods. For example, education, healthcare, and the basic infrastructure of moving your you know, farm produce from one place to the other. And a lot of African governments have got very ambitious targets, for example, of housing. We were talking about it with Matt in, in, in the room there. And we were saying 65% of our population is under the age of 18. Mm. Now, eventually, all those guys have to get jobs. They have to have housing. They, they have to have opportunities. And if you don't have non-state actors, the government can only do so much. But who's going to build those houses? Uh, let me give you an example. Um, we in Kenya have, we require 100,000 new houses every year. We're currently building 10,000 houses every year. So that means all our infrastructure, everything that we have, steel, aluminium, cement, is for 10,000 houses on, 
you know, a, a production of power of three gig, three gigawatts. But it's 80% renewable. But we have to then expand the, the, the manufacturing base 10 times. Yeah? So we have to do that 10 times. So that, that, the government is not going to build a cement plant. The government is not going to build a steel plant. Some business is going to do it. Yeah? But they also require the, the power, the electricity. So if we're, going to meet, if we're going to meet our goals for green development, we have to do all this and remain green. And the only way we can do it is through the investment by non-state actors in this infrastructure and also providing jobs for these young people. So we, ha we have to do all these things. It's like running on a treadmill and trying to change your shoes. It's not easy, you know. So, but but this, is, this is where we see the government's role is purely there as an enabler, a proof of concept. And then after that, the scale up has to be by, by other players. Thank you, Andrew. As we look forward, I mean, there's a lot of con concern, I think, at this COP. Questions around whether we're going to overshoot 1.5. Um, fear that we're not going to get the financing that many countries have been looking for on adaptation, loss and damage. Um, Civil society has a very critical role to play as well as, as a, what often is concerned, considered in the, in the transparency movement as a detergent that can wash away corruption but also can help with accountability. What message do you have for many of the civil society organizations who are also non-state actors that are looking to play a role here, whether they're analysts or whether they're shakers like young, young leaders from Fridays for the Future who are on the street trying to raise awareness, um, or whether there are think tanks coming up with policy solutions. How do you think civil society, in addition to business and the solutions that investors and others would bring to the table and, and what cities and other subnationals would bring to the table, um, how can civil society play a role and, and what would be your message to them here at COP27? <clears throat> I, I think uh, we have to recognize that if there is momentum on climate action is in big part thanks to them. Because again, with, we have gone through many, many crises. The COVID crisis, uh, the, of course, the different geopolitical difficulties we are facing in many places of the world. Of the world. And we see that the, the, the young activists are telling us these are important issues, but don't forget our future. And the problem is that this future is really decided and done now. So I think we should recognize that uh, they are a part of the movement, a part of the society that re in a way remind us every time that we are lagging behind what we should do. The second element is I think they need to, in their transition on being young and beginning their studies or finding jobs, they can be a part of the solution as well. In the jobs they will take, in the education they will receive, and I think that, in a way, that space that I think we have to respond to, to give them the tools to operate as well this change. We should not put all the responsibility of the change on their shoulders, but we should provide the tool for them to be operational and, and really active with the power instrument they need. And thirdly, I think we should listen when they say it's not enough and give them access to information uh, so they can really play that role. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that I think, um, you know, if we're going to solve this problem, it's not just up to governments, whether they be state actors or subnational governments, it's going to be the responsibility of everyone to do their bit. And, you know, civil society is doing their bit, you know, and they can do more by choosing who they bank with, making sure that they're aligned with uh, the values that we're trying to uh, support here, you know, where they shop. Um, uh, who they have their superannuation with, the whole range of things that they can do. And we're seeing those actions, uh, then uh, the, the biggest thing they can do is then determine who they're going to vote for at the ballot box. Uh, you know, if they're going to support candidates that are going to take strong action on climate change, that will drive a better outcome from our political class. So I think civil society has a really important role to play through their own individual actions and through their collective action uh, in driving governments to do better. 
You know, in our research, uh, both at Oxford and Columbia, um, and with Christiana Figueres, who was working with Florence on the, on the Paris Agreement, we found that there was this need for radical collaboration to drive this agenda. Um, and, you're, and you're speaking to this collaboration, this need to catalyze um, uh, and orchestrate different forms of, of, of joint action in different ways. Um, philanthropy is here in a big way and has been at many of the COPs. Um, how do you think philanthropy can play a role in trying to um, support the, the catalytic collaboration that's going to be required to get some of these actors who are trying to find new ways of working together without duplicating their efforts um, in a way that you know one plus one can get to 11? Um, because really we only have seven years to have emissions. Um, what is it we need to do? What are the new coalitions, the new breakthroughs? Having uh, been le be leading the European Climate Foundation, Laurence, um, and, and with that perspective, how do you see um, your peers working together to really enable the, the kind of enabling environment that is required to enable us to move as a movement of movements through this next period? I think there are two values or three to the philanthropy. Uh, the philanthropy money is uh, flexible. Uh, doesn't have the same requirement than the, the public funding, for example. And so I think that the first thing that philanthropy can do is to anticipate evolution and in a way support the, the discussion and the understanding and the knowledge of the actors that will finally make the change. I can take the example of South Africa, for example. Philanthropy helped enormously just to fund the research of the South African University, the academics, the discussion and the dialogue with the trade unions. That finally um, was the outcome was this national commission on climate that President Ramaphosa launched with every actor in the society. But this has been supported in advance by a, a number of research and, and anyway, civil society action. So to really look at the different possible scenario for the reform of the energy sector in South Africa, which was basically and still based on coal. So that one element, bringing free money, flexible money to support the people who want to do the change and don't have the resource to that. I think the second role is sometimes to prepare and help the pipeline of projects that will be necessary uh, in different countries and where this uh, money is not, of course, available by the international financial market on one side who want things ready-made or by even the public institution who require a lot, a lot of investment, intellectual investment and organizational to be, in a way, fundable. So that's the second element the philanthropy could do. And I think uh, the third one is, in a way, to fund all this advocacy and uh, global awareness that we need. Because sometimes there is a lot of polarization around climate action. For one country like Kenya, who has such an ambition target for renewable energy, as your president recently said, you have other countries where climate change is a very polarized uh, issue. Let's look at US, for example. And so that just trying to depolarize, to see it's a common problem, that climate doesn't have borders, uh, philanthropy doesn't, should not have borders, that's not the problem to be nationalistic, but just make understand we are all in the same boat. And that is, my view, a very big role for philanthropy, to help the ones, like Kenya is, is really a role model for Africa now, and uh, it's very important that everybody recognize that efforts and in a way v make visible that the change is happening. And I, I think that's typically the role of philanthropy, in my view, plus, of course, supporting some other action. But more than, that, more than ever, really make, make uh, this coalition of, of volunteers just to go forward. Matt, um, Laurence brought up this issue of polarization. <laughs> and as someone who's coming from, from a country that has really switched quite a lot in the last year, we've seen a lot of political change. But this polarization exists in many places, right? And, and part of the challenge to the climate movement and to non-state actors right now is to move from the frames that have been used to get a critical mass to mobilize to the frames that transcend that in order that we can move further together and really talk about what it means to address pollution and many of the, the, the critical issues that will move people on all sides of the political spectrum. 
How are you thinking about this question um, you know, in a country where you really need to move everyone forward to drive this agenda? Well, I mean, one of the reasons it was so polarised in Australia is it became a matter of ideology. Um, so, you know, the people on the right, they, you know, thought that taking action on climate change was going to destroy the world. And people on the left were thinking that, well, you know, not taking action on climate change uh, fast enough was... Uh, it, people on the left were sort of thinking that if we, um, you know, didn't go immediately, then the whole world would explode as well. So it was about trying to fight, build consensus, bringing people together, finding common ground. And the way we tried to do that in Australia is not just making it a moral and environment argument, we made it an economic argument. Because there's no country on the, in the world, arguably, that is better placed to benefit from the transition to a low carbon economy than Australia. We've got a lot of land that's unusable. We've got some of the best renewable resources anywhere on the planet. Um, you know, some of the best wind, some of the best solar, and access to a lot of water. So we're really well placed to not only provide the energy that's going to power the rest of the world, things like hydrogen, but the materials that are going to be, need to be built using low carbon inputs. Things, think green steel, think green aluminium, um, cement, things like that. Uh, we're really well placed to do that. So we started prosecuting the case differently in Australia, and that was the key to our success, making it an economic argument and not just talking about the threats of not taking action on climate change, but talking about the enormous economic opportunities to our nation by grabbing them right now and setting ourselves up for a more prosperous future. And we've been able to crash through. Andrew. I agree with Matt. I mean, <laughs> this, yeah, I've always said this one and a half degree story is so academic um, and it's so negative. Uh, you know, it's, it's scaremongering and it doesn't really work for long. I mean, I tell my kids all sorts of scary things and it only lasts for a little while, but so I have to give them some incentives. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, 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 the, the role of philanthropy and, uh, and civil society has to be one where we highlight some of these things. For example, there's very little being talked about um, mitigation or even just the issue of adaptability, for example, in the Sahel region of of Africa, northern Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, where most of the people are, are pastoralists. They keep animals. And, you know, in the last year or so, due to climate change, 80% of the animals have died. So, that is more real than the one and a half degrees, for sure. But the role of philanthropy is there to say, you can do it better. There's a better way to do this. There's a there's a better breed of animals that you, you, you can introduce without le losing your livelihood. But we're not seeing this. We, our picture is on big things. Power plants, hydrogen, um, nuclear, big things. Yet the real small incremental day-to-day -day things are right there in our faces and they're easy to, to sort out. We, 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 we need to focus on what affects people's lives day-to-day. -day. Uh, I, 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 I'm cognizant of the fact that if you're in Europe and you're waiting for the winter, climate change is going to be a real thing for you this winter. The war in Ukraine is going to be a real thing for you when you have to keep your house at uh, 18 degrees centigrade or what is it, 62 Fahrenheit. It's a real situation. So we need to think about what does, how do we give this message to individuals? How does it touch the individual? And this is the role of philanthropy. This is the role of, of, um, of uh, social um, media and action groups. I totally agree with you because, uh, one, because there will be very intelligent and clever solution. Take the example you were taking. <clears throat> the very difficult situation in Sahel and, and the north of Kenya. There are, one of my friends in Duwaru is making working with uh, the, breed, the cattle breeders and the farmers to try to see now with a new condition how they could in a way design the, the map of where can the, the, the animals could be at what period and try to negotiate that new condition. And that's true, there is not, we are, uh, the problem of philanthropy, and that's very good you say that, and I hope you will repeat that again and again, that will help me, <laughs> that they say, I want a, a quick fix, the big fix. Uh, the, the solution, the silver bullet, because I want to be the one saving the planet. 
So this is not hap this will not happen. Yeah. Nobody will save the planet if we don't do our job day to day. And those are the very powerful message I, I can tell. And I appreciate you you said. Well, this has been very lively, and uh, Andrew, I think you're challenging us to really think about the deficit that exists between the solutions that are being articulated here and the solutions that ordinary people are holding in their minds and, their, and the ancient wisdom that is also there that we need to somehow harness and, and bring to the very forefront of this agenda um, if we're going to achieve the mindset shift that we need as well as the, the science and every other part of the agenda that we have here. Um, I just want to leave us with maybe one very brief comment from each of you, which is, you know, Laurence uh, at the beginning talked about the need to integrate the, this whole agenda much more meaningfully into how we think beyond COP27 and, and look at the role of non-state actors um, beyond even the Marrakesh partnership. Um, what is your vision for how people everywhere would start to see themselves as being part of this agenda as we move out of Egypt and into this next phase um, in the decade of delivery? Um, start, starting with you, Andrew, and you each just take one minute and we can, we can wrap up the panel. I'm going to take it less than one minute. There's a saying in Kenya that buffaloes hang out together in a herd, not because they love each other, but they are stronger when they're together. So that, that's my message. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a role for not only national governments, but sub-national governments in driving the agenda forward. Those sub-national governments who are responsible for so many of the levers that are going to reduce our emissions in ways that also grow our economies. I think there is a really important role for sub-national governments, as is for everyone, if we're going to deliver on our ambitions and leave our planet to our kids better than we found it. I agree with the two points of my, pan my colleagues panelists, and I will add, take the situation f with the citizen, and the citizen would, would be the more, you know, they have to start from there, and we cannot just think that the top-down solution will, ma will work. And I'm going to take moderator's uh, liberty and just add that as a, coming from education in this moment, I think we need to think beyond a few hundred people coming through schools and around how are we going to help millions of people understand how we're going to make a just transition happen and that we need educational institutions to really step up in entirely new ways if we're going to make this uh, massive shift in terms of the skills gap. Um, and so thank you to our uh, partners, to, to the Climate Action team and to Kite, and thank you to our panelists, to Andrew, to Matt, to Laurence, and to all of you for joining us. Uh, we're delighted to be here and looking forward to having a conversation together as we move out of this. Thank you, Rajiv.